royal road. Majesty, dominion, power, that is the historic conception of monarchy, the exalted path of kings. Majesty indeed there is, but for the great state occasions rather than for every day. Dominion, yes, for the British Empire stretches to the four corners of the earth. And power, because our king is now the only political link between its self-governing community. But shall we look for a few minutes at the king as an individual, forgetting the majesty, dominion and power in his common fellowship with all of us. Here is a man, happy in his home life, blessed with the joys of a charming family, called suddenly to the leadership of an empire at war. Let us realize that the hardest duty of King George VI is to live up to the expectations of nearly 500 million subjects. Our expectation is that he should symbolize all that is best in British character, policy, and ideals. In war, it is just those things that are on trial. We wondered, didn't we, how we should ourselves endure the horrors of air raids. It is because there has been no weakening anywhere that the German campaign of terror from the skies has failed. And the moral example of the King's presence in Buckingham Palace, a favorite Nazi target, has had its effect. They hope to bomb him out, but the king and queen are still in London. In quiet courage and endurance, he is indeed fully identified with his people. It is his royal way to visit the bombed areas to express his admiration of the sufferer's fortitude, admiration and sympathy. The king and queen must know more about the sufferings of their fellow countrymen than any of their subjects. Wherever they have gone, in London, Merseyside, Scotland, Plymouth and Coventry, the effect has been mutual encouragement. And encouragement means just what it implies, the giving or fostering of courage. Of course, the king in his work has one incalculable blessing, the partnership of the queen. I have if ever a man was lucky in this respect, it is he. That is transparently true. Have you ever seen the Queen looking other than happy and interested? Have you ever seen her looking the least bit bored or even tired? The reason is that the Queen is happy and is interested. Her smile and radiance proceed from a real sympathy and a real understanding. She never misses an opportunity to perform a graceful or human act of kindness. It has fallen to these two people to lead an empire's war effort. And while the Queen's first care is for the humanitarian side of the conflict, the King must dedicate himself to those who are engaged in the winning of victory. We see him with his sailors, men who are fighting the battle of the Atlantic. How many times in the history of this nation has her fate depended on the courage and endurance of her seamen? Even in this war, which has seen a huge growth in the importance of air power, it is still true that Britain's lifeline is her sea route across the Atlantic. The seamen of the Royal Navy are safeguarding the sea lanes while their comrades of the Merchant Navy traverse them with essential food and supplies. To wage its own battle in the clouds, the Navy has the fleet air arm whose pilots are honored by a visit from the King. launching of the mighty battleship, Duke of York. <laughs> then with the Royal Air Force. He shows his interest in the newest form of aerial warfare by a visit to British paratroops. He, the first of the Royal House of Windsor to gain his wings, now presents the rewards of bravery and gallantry to the pilots who routed the Luftwaffe.
with the army in training for the battles of Britain or the continent, he handles the Tommy gun. On a visit to the Canadians, he goes for a ride in a Bren carrier. He remembers the devotion of his Indian subjects who have come so long away to fight for their king, emperor. Nor does he forget that latest creation of a resourceful and determined people, the home guard, to whom on demand he proves his identity. The king heartens by periodic visits all those fighting services of the empire of which he is commander in chief. Yes, he has lived up to all those expectations which we had formed of kingship as the embodiment and reflection of a people's spirit. He has lived up to all our expectations as the head of that great gathering of nations who are sworn to overthrow the Nazis. Among them, the great dominions of the cross. But there is something more, something personal, the same quality which inspired him to meet the new American ambassador at the station on his arrival. By his own personal inclinations, the king is adding further luster to his high office. This is a war of the workshop as well as of the battlefield. The king has always made a study of industrial conditions. When he goes on his inspections of factories, arsenals and shipyards where the weapons of war are being forged, he carries with him a genuine interest in the man and woman at the bench and a sincere desire to promote their welfare. They know it and his words of thanks, his expression of the nation's appreciation are so much the more acceptable. When all is said and done, everything comes down to the individual, to the quality of each man and woman doing his or her job and the influence of their characters on others. That doesn't mean at work only. Home life is important. The fact that the home life of the royal family is such a pattern of happiness is one more guarantee of the character of its members, children as well as parents. Queen's amused consternation when Princess Elizabeth drops a stitch. There is a new world being born of this conflict. On that, everyone is agreed. It will be a new world in which there will be, for everyone, a fairer share of the blessings of life. And the royal pair is traveling the road to this new world, a royal road surrounded by their people's love and leading to the new world of peace, fellowship, and freedom. It may not be the millennium, but it will be a freer, more democratic world. It is a world which already has its inspiration in the king and queen.